Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Daniel. I'm the pastor of worship ministries here. We are excited that you are here with us and that you've chosen to worship with us. I wanted to give you a few announcements before we sing our opening hymn. I wanted to let you know that after the service today, we, um, after we finished up here, downstairs we have a small meal. If you're interested in being a part of that with us, we invite you to join us for that. It gives us a chance to get to know you better. Also, um, to get to know you better, if you see in your pews in the front there, right in front of you, there's a manila card, and that gives us uh, an opportunity for you, if you would be so generous as to give your, um, your name and your address and, and a little bit of information about yourself. And then on the back, it has a prayer request, some lines there. If you would fill that out, if you have some particular needs. Um, later on in the week, our pastoral team will get together, and we will be um, going over those. And we want to pray and bring um, your petitions before the Lord as well. I want to let you know that we're thinking of you in that area as well, and ask that the Lord continue to reign over us. Now, next week, it's a very, very important date for the church, because that is the date where we have the church picnic. And the church picnic is going to be at Oaks Park, as usual. Um, if you need a ride, or if you are able to drive, or if you plan on attending, right over here at the Welcome Center, there's a sign-up sheet. We need to know, first of all, how many people are attending, because we need to know how much food to cook, and also if we can make sure that rides are taken care of. also want to let you know that we have some... Uh, admission tickets into Oaks Park that are available at a discounted price. So if you are interested in having some food with us, enjoying the fellowship, and then afterwards going on rides, um, <laughs> feel free to, um, we have some opportunities for you to purchase some, some discounted tickets for that. Now, I um, also want to let you know, last thing, is that um, we have our quarterly business meeting that will be happening downstairs after the service as well. So we would like you for you to join us for that as well. Now, knowing that the Lord has met us in this place, that he continues to work in and through us, let us give praise to him. Would you stand and let's sing this hymn. and 
breath come with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again. In court might be a door. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the mission committee, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about the special offering this month, which is one great hour of sharing. And the theme for this year is one of my favorite verses. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So I want to tell you something I thought was quite exciting and had no idea I did not know this. Did you know that One Great Hour Sharing actually began 73 years ago in response to a devastation of World War II? On a Saturday evening, March 26, 1949, a national broadcast titled One Great Hour featured a remarkably assembled of national leaders and <clears throat> celebrities. The 33rd president, Harry S. Truman, radio address during the broadcast included, this was included in the following. And I just want to read it to you because I thought it was quite remarkable that that many years ago, in what he had to say is actually something we would probably hear today. And this is what he said. There are thousands of children in foreign lands today who have no memory of their parents, no knowledge of the meaning words of home and family, and who have forgotten what it feels like to have enough to eat. There are hopeless thousands who wander among the shattered towns seeking a place to rest seeking security and a chance to begin their lives anew. There are many who pray to God only in secret, fearing persecution if they profess their beliefs openly. It is hard for us to comprehend grief and distress such as this because in America we are much more fortunate. Our country has been blessed with material riches. Our homes are secure. We can go to church and we can worship God as we desire. We know that we enjoy these great blessings, not because of any special merit on our part, but because of the bounty of God. It is his providence that we owe the riches of our country and our heritage of freedom. Since these good things come to us from him, we know that we must use them for the good of others in accordance with his will which I thought that was pretty special. One great hour of sharing, if you, if you so feel moved to give to that, I think that there's envelopes in front of you in the pews, and if there's not, you can just write O-G-H on an envelope and put the funds in there. When you give to One Great Hour of Sharing, you deploy sources to people in need all around the world and in our own communities. When man-made or natural disasters strike, Love responds, not just for the immediate future, but for the long haul. When we give to One Great Hour Sharing, we are working alongside families to restore not only structures, but hope. Your giving ensures that no matter how difficult the situation, love remains. As the ushers get ready to take the offering, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. The that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Your world says that we should give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give to the effective growth of your kingdom. Amen.
presence Lord we thank you God for being our refuge for being our steady rock where we stand you are good Lord you have always been good thank you for this day thank you for this beautiful morning for the new mercies you have given us this morning and that's why we sing Lord that we will always praise you we will always glorify you in everything because you are worthy, God. You're worthy of our praise. We thank you so much. Jesus. Like a ring of solid gold, like 
like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledged yourself to me and it's why I see your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my Father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt. And rid of all her shame and known by her true name and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised when angels and saints we sing and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing That's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. as our ushers are uh, coming forward um, for the offering. No? Oh, I, we did the offering for the... Oh, do we do the offering again? We did the offering for the missions, and now we're doing the offering. Okay. Ushers, come on down. We're going to do it again. Steve, would you like to do the prayer for the offering? I can pray for the offering. That'd be great. Don't you hate it when the guy who doesn't know what he's talking about gets involved? I apologize for that. I, if you thought you were giving to the regular offering at the last time the, the offering was received, it was just for one great hour of sharing. So we're going to give you another chance to give. So ushers, if you can... No, you don't. There's no plates. Okay. If you'd like to give some more money at the end of the service, just give it to the usher at the end. All right? Sorry about that. 
We're actually going to do, oh, you can give by credit card if you want, online giving. That's not as, what's the word? It's not as symbolic to put something in the offering plate, but the money spends just as well. So, so now we're going to do the scripture reading from Psalm 63, and it's from a version of the Bible that I don't own, so I'm just going to read it with you from the screen. So uh, here we go. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, my right hand uphold, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth, they shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Who, all who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of the liars shall be stopped. The word of the Lord. Won't you join me in prayer? Dear God, uh, we thank you so much today that we can be together in your house, that we have this beautiful day outside. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would all have an opportunity to enjoy that in one way or another. We're grateful for all the things that you do for us. And Lord, like the psalmist today, our soul thirsts for you. Our flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Lord, we look upon you here <clears throat> in your sanctuary. We behold your power and your glory because your steadfast love is better than life. And so, Lord, as the song we just sang reminds us, our lips will praise you. Your praise will ever be on our lips. And because of that, we will bless you as long as we live. And in your name, we will lift our hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, some of you may remember this, some of you may not, but we have an annual theme here at First Baptist Church for 2022, and our annual theme is this, looking up to God for meaning in life. Why don't you all say that with me? Just make sure you're awake. Looking up to God for meaning in life. <clears throat> this is a theme that relates specifically to the idea of worship which is one of the key ministry areas here at First Baptist Church. I remember working with a group of people years ago when I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, that came together in a very special way, looking up to God for meaning in their lives. These were folks, most of whom who had suffered horrible tragedies in their respective homelands, plural. They were refugees. They were immigrants from Latin America from Mexico and Central America. Now, there's a lot of politici politicization, politicization. People get political about it when it comes to immigration. But things become different when you really begin to get to know the stories of folks who have come to this country in search of a new life after having lost everything in the land of their birth. I mean, can you imagine that if you went through that yourself? There were young men who had fled because of a very real fear of being killed if they didn't join the gangs that controlled their neighborhoods. And there were elderly grandmothers, and I remember their faces. These older women who had been shopkeepers in their countries, they had to close their shops because they could no longer pay the security fees charged by the cartels. These are not things that just happen in the movies. These are real things that people have to deal with. These were people who knew the depths of human brokenness and darkness in a way 
that I hope I never have to know it. No surprise then that they came together at our little Spanish language ministry called Mesa. Anybody know what Mesa means? Table. That's what it means. We come to the Lord's table, don't we? And they were looking up to God for meaning in life. And to this day, I respect them as some of the strongest and most inspiring fellow believers in Christ on this planet. It was in that context that Brother Luis showed up with his wife. Luis was a contractor of Mexican heritage traveling from out of state. They were in town for a few months because Luis was working on a construction project. He came to me one day and asked if he could help out with the music. Now, that's always an interesting question, isn't it? Because you never know if they're good or not, right? Well, let me tell you what. We gave Luis a chance. He played the guitar, and he played it well. And that first Sunday, he helped out. He introduced us to a song that we sang just a couple minutes ago. I bet it was new to most of you, but there's a couple of you that I'm pretty sure already know it. And that song is called Levanto Mis Manos, or in English, I Will Lift Up My Hands. And I have to say, it changed everything for us. As he sang the song, it was as if the Holy Spirit of God just descended on our little group of about 20 people at that time. Though we didn't have lyrics projected on the screen up there, because it was a new song to us, we had never heard it, the people spontaneously began to sing along. It was one of the most powerful expressions of worship that I have ever experienced. And as time went by, these Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters in Christ who had been the victims of atrocities in their homelands adopted this song as their anthem. You know, in, in our church, <clears throat> when the choir starts up again in September, they'll be talking about anthems, these great songs that resonate with not only the choir but the people of God in the congregation. Well, these folks, these, these folks in Mesa had their own anthem. And this was important to them because they had this innate need to experience God in worship. And for them, that experience involved not only the song itself, but the need to lift their hands and to look up when they had been so downtrodden, when their lives had been so difficult, when everything had been taken away from them. And I love to sing the song because it always catapults me into God's presence and, and to those days of worshiping alongside these amazing people. A couple weeks ago, when we looked at Psalm 150, the big lesson was that we are called to a posture of praise. And when we were talking about postures of praise, we were talking about them in a more figurative sense. But today, we're talking about a literal posture of praise, a position of the human body, and that is the lifting of your hands. Everybody put your hands up. Lift them up. Stick them up, right? Put them down. You can put them down. That's fine. And you can put them up. You can put them down whenever you want in church here. I want you to know you're welcome to do that and worship as you feel led to worship. Because there are various such literal postures of praise. There's the posture of kneeling in praise before God. There's the posture of laying prostrate or with your face flat on the ground out of reverence to God. <clears throat> Many of us prefer the posture of sitting or even laying down as we praise God in our hearts, maybe as we're about to drift off to sleep or if we're contemplating what God has done in our lives. There's even the posture of standing up in praise as we have done today in church. I don't know about you all, but for me, that's a very important way. I prefer to sing when I'm standing up. Anybody else? I have to stand. It's more helpful to me. I can sing louder and better. But today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the posture of praise that we take, as the song says, when we lift our hands. Why? Because I believe, and this is our big idea today, that people have an innate need to experience God in worship. I believe that we were designed to do it. 
And as a relatively new friend of mine told me the other day, you know, human beings are kind of like bees. You know, bzz, everybody go bzz, right? Bzz. We're kind of like bees. What was a bee designed to do? Huh? What do they make? Honey. A bee is designed to make honey. So when that bee is making honey, that bee is doing what it was created to do, what it was intended to do. And it's just buzzing along, having a great time. Like that, we as human beings created in the image of God, we were created to worship. And so when we worship God, when we're doing what we were intended to do, there's something really powerful about that. This is why for millennia, God's people have used different means to worship God because people worship in different ways. God's people have used music to connect with God through their sense of what? Hearing. This is why since the days that God prescribed the artistic detail in very long passages of Scripture, how the tabernacle and how the temple were to be constructed. And, and through that, we have connected with God through our sense of vision. This is why since ancient times, incense, we don't really use incense in our church, but incense has been used to help people worship God using their sense of smell. This is why since the Last Supper, Jesus has been calling his disciples around a table, amen, to share a meal together in remembrance of him so that we can even worship God using our sense of what? Taste. And finally, this is why in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's people have used certain postures of worship, such as lifting their hands to connect with God through their sense of physical feeling. The lifting of hands. It's a human gesture that appears throughout Scripture, and it means different things in different places. In the Bible, people lift their hands when making a serious promise. Sound familiar? This is very similar to what we do today when folks lift their hands in the courtroom to solemnly swear before the trial begins, right? People lifted their hands as a gesture of blessing toward other people. And lifting hands was used as a symbol of support. God himself is pictured as raising his hand as a symbol of of his power over creation. So it's an important symbol. It's an important figure that pops up throughout Scripture. But our focus today is how in Scripture hands were lifted either in prayer or in praise. So let's take a minute to talk about that first one, okay? How number one, God's people can lift their hands in prayer. I want to give you some Scriptures here. First one is 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. 1 Timothy 2.8, where Paul told his protege, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. It apparently was common for men in particular to assume this posture in the worship of worship in the early church, since there were actually paintings on the walls of the catacombs of Rome where, due to persecution, the early Christians were forced to worship corporately in that part of the world. And, and, and those, those murals depict them uh, praying in this posture. So this is a historical reality. To pray with uplifted hands indicated that the one doing so had some level of spiritual and moral maturity and that they had positive relationships with other people, which is clear from Paul's insistence that they only lift up holy hands without anger or quarreling. After all, there's something very different about lifting holy hands in prayer as opposed to clenching your fists getting ready for a fight. Amen? Amen? So I don't think it's accidental. I think there's something important there. And although this practice of lifting up hands in prayer seems common in the early church, it had been inherited from ancient Israel, according to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22. Solomon, remember King Solomon? Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he prayed at the dedication of the temple of the Lord. Later on in Israel's history, after the exile in Babylon, 
Ezra also lifted his hands in passionate prayer to the Lord as he said in Ezra 9 verse 5, And at the evening sacrifice I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. In Lamentations 2, verse 19, the prophet Jeremiah also used this physical gesture as a passion-filled form of prayer before God from, the, from people who were in dire need, people who needed help. He called on God's people to, and I quote, arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night, watches. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation like that where you just have to cry out to God? Well, well uh, Jeremiah apparently was crying out to God, and, and we find out that he was lifting his hands as well because it says, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your, what? Hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. When we pray for our families, when we pray for our loved ones, when we pray for our city, do we pray passionately? Do we pray with our hands lifted? Do we pray looking around us even at the needs in our streets and in our neighborhoods? Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. And for the psalmist, lifting hands in prayer was a way of really experiencing and connecting with God when he said in Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer be counted as incense, there's incense again, before you, and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. It was a sacrifice to God to lift your hands. There was nothing magical about it. It wasn't that by doing so, you were guaranteed to receive what you asked of God, nor did it mean that you were any more holy or any closer to God. But there was something about lifting hands that seemed to help God's people to really focus on Him, to express their passion to God, to express that they needed Him. You know, as a father, and I have four kids, most of you know that, some may not, but um, as a dad especially of my younger children, Oscar and Lucy, when I pray with them, I invite them to do this. Everybody do this. I invite them to do this or this. Some of you do this. And I invite them to do this. And perhaps when you were little, if you grew up in church, you were taught to pray with your hands like this and with your eyes closed. And why did your parents or your grandparents or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor, why did they teach you to pray like that? That's right. Because as little kids who are wiggling all over the place, it helped us to concentrate, didn't it? It helped us to focus. Now, do we always need to pray in that way? Will God not listen if you don't? Absolutely not. You don't have to fold your hands at all, and you don't even have to close your eyes to pray. And I, for one, am grateful for that because actually most of my prayer, if we're thinking about time, happens in my car when I'm driving, okay? We're not being legalistic about this, okay? But there is something sometimes that's special about folding the hands and closing the eyes that helps a human being of any age to focus, to concentrate on God, to experience God, which is that innate need which all people have. So, one way to worship God with hands lifted up is in prayer. The other way is this, number two. God's people can lift up their hands in praise. Amen? God's people can lift up their hands in praise. And I want you all to be challenged by that. I want you to feel okay doing that. This is an old traditional Baptist church, but you can lift your hands to Jesus. Amen? They've been doing it long before this church was even thought of. Amen? And if I go to Santiago's church over there, they're lifting their hands. Amen? We can lift our hands. We can praise God. We can get excited. We can even dance, folks. David did it. 
We can have a good time, and we should be having a good time in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. We can have salvation not by figuring it all out, not by cleaning up our act, but how? By believing. If that isn't something to get excited about, if that isn't something to celebrate, then I don't think we have anything to celebrate. Amen? We've got something incredible to celebrate, to get excited about, to lift our hands in praise about. Psalm 63 really captures not only this idea, but the fact that God's people really, and I mean really, need Him. In verse 1, the psalmist, who I believe is David, cries out passionately, O God, You are my God, earnestly I seek You. My soul thirsts for You, my flesh faints for You, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon You in the sanctuary, beholding Your power and glory. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean really thirsty. I am right now, in fact. I did not necessarily plan to do that, but I am really thirsty. And there's the power of suggestion, amen? But you know what I mean. You've been in a situation where there's no water available, where there's no air conditioning, where you're outside in the sun. And if you've lived east of the Rocky Mountains, you know where I'm going. You've experienced that humidity, haven't you? It's terrible. Oh, man, I'm so glad I live west of the Rockies. Amen. It is good to be out here. It is good to not have that humidity. But have you ever been thirsty? And all you can think about is water. Water. Just recently, I've been trying to get back into uh, distance running, believe it or not. And, and for me, it's one of the big ways I personally connect with the Lord. It is my posture of praise as I cruise along. And, and no, I don't generally lift up my hands while I'm running along. That would look kind of weird. And uh, I'd probably fall and hurt myself, right? Um, but I remember training for the Kansas City Marathon. And, and you're going to learn why I don't like humidity, okay? Um, I was training for the Kansas City Marathon. And, and if you've ever done a marathon, you know that it's not the sort of thing you just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. You know, you, you can't do it that way. You have to train for months until your body has adjusted to the ridiculous, insane, and crazy idea of running 26.2 miles in about four hours' time if you're a big, slow guy like myself. So I'm training for this marathon, and the backbone of any training program is the weekly long run. Okay, you've got to have a long run every week which I always do on a Saturday. And at first you start with a long run that may only be four miles, and then it goes up to five, and then seven, and then ten, and so on, until you reach a long run distance of 20 miles. And let me tell you, you want to do that earlier in the day. Amen? Even here, you want to do that sort of thing earlier in the day. But you've got to understand that like most major marathons. The Kansas City Marathon is in the early fall, which means that most of your training is done when? Like now, in the summertime, right? Not only that, but at that time, again, I was living in the Midwest. I was in Omaha, Nebraska, which is well known for its horribly hot and humid summers. And the only way to make it through a 20-mile run in such conditions is to literally Wear your water. This won't cut it. you got to have those funny little uh, containers. You've probably seen people around in downtown Portland especially. They'll have them on their belts. They'll even sometimes have it, a backpack, you know, with the water. What's that called? Anybody know what that thing's called? Camelback or something like that? Yeah. I anyway, so you got to literally wear your water. And, um, and, and, and so I had one of those, but I only had one in my hand. Okay, I should have had the belt, but I didn't want to take the belt. I, I didn't even have a belt. Um, so one day, I'm on my long run. It was so incredibly hot, probably close to 100 degrees, and, and I was so thirsty that I ran out of water completely about halfway into my run. And the problem when you are halfway into your run is you've run out 10 miles, and then you've got 10 miles to go back, right? So I'm trying to, to get through this. And, and, and the thing is, I'm not in the city. I'm in the middle of these cornfields in Nebraska, there's nothing around. I guess I could have stopped and, 
eating some corn or something like that, but I don't even think it was ripe. And so I'm jogging, I'm trying to jog, and I'm just getting thirstier and thirstier. I got so thirsty that I had to stop running. There was nothing else I wanted other than water. I knew where I was, and I knew that there was a park ahead in just a mile where I could refill at a drinking fountain. But let me tell you what, that was the longest mile of my entire life. Is it any coincidence that David, who lived in another very hot part of the world, in the days before refrigeration and air conditioning, compares his need for God to his need for life-giving, refreshing water. Is it a coincidence? Mm -mm. Oh, no. And for that matter, is it simply by chance that Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that he had come to offer her what? Living water, right? You see, we all need God. Those of us who have a relationship with God, we know that already. Like the psalmist and like the marathon runner, we recognize when we're running on empty. We realize when we need to get back to the source of living water. We already know that there's a spiritual thirst inside that only God can satisfy. But you know what? Even people who don't have a relationship with God still need God. Amen? We all need the Lord. They thirst, but they don't know how to satisfy that thirst. To use the words of our annual theme again, they are looking for meaning in life. They just don't know yet where to look. They may seek after all the pleasures of this life. They may try to advance in their careers. They may try to do lots of good deeds helping other people. They may seek all sorts of different types of spiritual teaching even. But they still end up thirsting. Why? Because the only thing that satisfies in a dry and weary land where there is no water is what? Water. And only Jesus is the source of living water. Again, people, all people have an innate need to experience God. It's not a matter of preference. No, it is a matter of necessity. We all need to be looking up to God for meaning in life. And David knew that. So he said this, because your steadfast love is better than life. What a statement. My lips will praise you. Your praise will ever be on my lips. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift my hands. So great was David's need for the Lord and his love that he considered him better than life itself. The Lord was the living water that he needed in the midst of that dry land, and it was through praise which he expressed by lifting up his hands that David drank in that living water. It was through authentic praise of God that David's soul was comforted and refreshed as he was filled once again with joy. And we church, like David, no matter if we too are walking through a dry and weary land where there is no water, can sing, I will lift my hands, Lord. Even though I am weary, I will lift up my hands, Lord. Even when life is troubled, when I lift up my hands, oh, I can feel your presence. When I lift up my hands, my burdens are gone. There's new strength from you, O oh God. And it all happens. Yes, it begins when I, everybody do it, Lift up my hands. Some of you come from other church traditions. In some older, more traditional Euro-American Baptist circles, it was not common to do this at all. People just came to church in their Sunday best. They sang the hymns. They sat down and they quietly listened to the sermon. And I think it was a lot like that here at First Baptist historically. There, there was not much expression of emotion outwardly, if I may be so bold, at all. However, those who come from a more charismatic background or who are from certain cultural backgrounds will have been used to people lifting one hand 
or two in worship, or sometimes halfway up like I do, and you see me because I'm right up front. You can, you can make fun of me later. That's fine. Uh, but is one way better than another? I don't think so at all. I believe Scripture gives us freedom to assume different postures of worship. It's all about how you best experience God in worship yourself. For some people, that is done quietly with no outward expression at all. It's important for that to be said. And for others, it is helpful for them to lift up their hands like David did. And regardless of what type of worshiper you are, the only thing that matters is that like David, you are able to praise God passionately within your heart saying, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because human beings whose postures of praise can be as different as the way we each look on the outside, nonetheless all have that same innate need to experience God in worship. Just as we have an innate need for water, we have this innate need for the living water of Christ. I've been to a lot of different worship services in my day, and I bet many of you have as well. I've worshiped with sisters and brothers in Christ of various denominations from different cultures in different countries. Sometimes, like the Latino segment of my church in Omaha, they lifted their hands in praise to God, and other times they were perfectly still. When I lived in Spain about 20 years ago, I had a really hard time finding a gathering of Protestant believers. Go figure. Catholic country, right? But I finally did. Their pastor was actually a missionary from the United Kingdom. There were mostly older people from various countries, and there were only about 20 or 30 of them in this church. The worship service is what I would call pretty old school. It was the old hymns, it was an organ, and no lifting of the hands or any of that stuff at all. But let me tell you what, there was something amazing about that loving, faithful little church of people from different nations that put me in tune with the Lord. When I was in Bolivia, I attended a Quechua worship service with several hundred indigenous people present. Their worship style involved some of this lifting of the hands stuff, but the thing that stood out there rather than their posture was their music. It was the unexpected sound of Andean panpipes and the charango, which is actually made out of an armadillo. Can you believe that? It was amazing. It was so beautiful. And it transported me into the courts of Almighty God. When I was in Mexico one time, I found myself worshiping among fellow believers who lifted their hands as high as they could in worship, and they sang passionately. In each church I visited, almost the entire congregation would come to the altar after the service. They'd be on the altar. They'd be down there in front. They'd be everywhere. And some of them would be laying prostrate even, like totally flat on their faces on the ground. The whole scene touched my heart, and I found myself going to the altar as well. Not because I needed to believe in Jesus for the first time, but because that's how we were worshiping God in a new and a fresh way. And when I've attended predominantly African-American churches in North Portland, the joyful sounds of gospel music have drawn me immediately into God's presence. And it's in those settings I can't help but lift my, highs, my hands so high you see my pit stains. I'm telling you. You've got to worship in a place like that, amen? And when I worship God here, surrounded by my church family, I also experience God's presence. Don't you? Do you? <laughs> if you don't, let's talk some more. We're going to talk more next week about it. When I hear the organ setting the tone for worship, which is unique for our church. There's a lot of churches that don't even have that anymore, amen? Amen. It sets the tone. Rumbling here in the sanctuary. Sometimes I look up and I wonder, if, is anything going to fall down? You know? And I love what you do, Nate. It's a blessing for us. When our voices join together to lift those great 
ancient hymns of praise to God Almighty in a way that tends to resonate with our older brothers and sisters. I love it. When we sing along to the guitar, the keys, and the congas, those passionate contemporary songs that tend to resonate with our younger brothers and sisters. I love it. In the midst of this beautiful diversity of worship expression, our hearts, people, blend together into one multi-generational song of praise to our great God, as together we say, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. You see, it shouldn't matter where you are, who you're with, or how they worship. All that really matters is that like the psalmist, you passionately seek after the God who loves you and who sent His Son to die for you on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for your sins, and who on the third day rose again. And if you don't yet know God, all that really matters is that you recognize this innate need within your own heart to be looking up to God for meaning in your life, to recognize that there is nothing else that can satisfy that need No amount of achievement in your career, no amount of money, no amount of volunteerism or doing good, but there is a need in your heart that only the God of the universe can satisfy. There is a thirst that can only be quenched by the living water of Jesus Christ. And so we are all really summoned, called to the same place. Whether we know Jesus or whether we do not yet know Jesus, We're called to the foot of the cross, aren't we? To a place where we truly experience God in worship. A place where all that really matters is that your life be one of unbroken praise that goes on and on as you experience God in your own way, in your daily life, day after day. A place where you can echo the words of Psalm 150 saying, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are so grateful that you call us to worship you in whatever way we can worship you. Lord, we are so grateful that we can worship you quietly in our hearts and in our souls. We are so grateful, God, that we can dance before you as David did and others have done throughout history and are even doing probably in this very moment. We are so grateful, Lord, that we can lift our hands. We can look up to you physically, but also within our hearts. We can worship you with old songs. We can worship you with new songs, with this kind of instrument or that kind of instrument. There are so many ways we can worship you, and we're so grateful for that. Because wherever we are, whoever we're with, whatever generation we're a part of, we can worship right now next to each other, because we are serving you, Lord, and you are worthy of our praise, however it comes at you, Lord. And so we are grateful to be together. And for the one here today, Lord, who is aware that they are missing something in their life, who is aware that there's some kind of need, Lord, I pray that you would open their hearts, open their minds to the fact that the thirst that they are experiencing is none other but a thirst for you, Jesus, the living water who can refresh them, who can restore them, and that by simply believing in you, they can can be brought into a relationship with the God of the universe who has created us for the purpose of praise and worship. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, you're welcome here at the altar if you'd like to pray. If you'd like to ask questions about your faith or express some commitment to the Lord, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Daniel as he leads us in our closing hymn. Let's stand. My Jesus, I love. Redeemer, 
my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Before I give the benediction, just wanted to remind you, we have our quarterly meeting downstairs, also a light lunch. We hope to see you there. Let me, let me give the benediction. And now, may you continue to sing and make music with songs and hymns, proclaiming God's goodness. And by doing that, may the world know that we are one as Jesus and the Father are one. And all God's people said, Greet somebody that you don't know. Have a great week. Thanks. Thanks.